Hi guys. So is India a civilizational state or a nation state? If you follow any Indian politics, you will know that that's one of the biggest debates of our generation that is India a nation state or a civilization state. And frankly, I'm not going to comment on that. I mean, I know I agree. I think that uh, India is a civilizational state, but why I think India is a civilizational state, that's a huge discussion and I'm not qualified enough to make all the arguments. I just uh, like the arguments in favor of India being a civilizational state more than India being a nation state. And frankly nation state the idea of a nation state was invented just in 1642 uh, by the Westphalian uh, tre- peace treaty. So before that India existed. So what were we if if not a nation state? So uh, it's it's pretty obvious to me that India is a civilizational state. But this video is about uh, some of the arguments presented by historians uh, Radha Kumud Mukherjee and Acharya Jodhunath Sarkar because uh, as we all know that Jodhunath Sarkar, R.C. Mojumdar and Radha Kumud Mukherjee these three might be the greatest historians India has ever produced and uh, although uh, Radha Kumud Mukherjee and R.C. Mojumdar both of them uh, believed in the Aryan invasion theory because of the amount of evidence they had at the time I don't, I'm not sure about Jodhunath Sarkar but they are interesting in the sense that even though they believe that the Aryan invasion happened, even then they make the case that India is a great place and India is a civilizational state. Whereas leftists will tell you that because the Aryan invasion happened, that uh, all Brahmins and Kshatriyas etc. are the invaders and everyone else was the indigenous population and therefore Brahmins suck and therefore Hinduism sucks because Hinduism is an Aryan religion. So. Uh, now we know that Aryan invasion theory is is absolute nonsense. It's been genetically disproven. It's been linguistically disproven. It's been archaeologically disproven. Just if you want to debate Ar- Aryan invasion theory, take it up with <laughs> Dr. Niraj Rai or Shrikanji Talagiri. Anyway, uh, let's learn what what Radha Kumud Mukherjee has to say about this. The perennial beauty of the Himalayas has captivated the national imagination and has made them the refuge of holy men drawing unending dreams of pilgrims. Indeed, the Hindus' pilgrimages are always to the glacier-clad mountain, the palm-clad seashore or ocean isle, or the almost impenetrable depths of hill and jungle, where the tread of the generations of man has scarcely been heard and nature left free to exercise her healing and healthful influence. Thus, the Indian treats the beauty of place in a peculiar way foreign to the West. His method of appreciating and celebrating it is quite different. A spot of beauty is no place for social enjoyment or self-indulgence. It is the place for self-restraint, for solitary meditation, which leads the mind from nature up to nature's God, which is why it's a problem with the location of Kedarnath uh, temple right now. It's, It's become a picnic spot. Had Niagara been situated on the Ganges, how different would have been its valuation by humanity? Instead of occasional picnics and railway pleasure trips, the perennial pilgrimage of worshipping crowds. Uh, instead of those things, it would be a pilgrimage of worshipping crowds. Instead of parks, ashramas. Instead of hotels, temples. Instead of ostentatious excess, simple austerity. Instead of the desire to, instead of the desire to harness its mighty forces to the chariot of human utility, an absorbing subjectivity, a complete detachment from the body and the outward world to feed the life of the spirit. Thus, the institution of pilgrimage is undeniably a most powerful instrument for developing the geographical sense in the people, which enables them to think and feel that India is not a mere congeries of geographical fragments, but a single, though immense, organism filled with the tide of one strong pulsating life from one end, from end to end. The visit to holy places as an imperative religious duty has made wide travelling a national habit in India in all ages of life, with young and old alike, and travelling in ages preceding the era of steam and mechanical transport could not but promote a deep knowledge of the tracts traversed which is easily escaped by modern globetrotters. It was this supremely Indian institution in fact which served in the past in the place of the modern railway and facilities for for travel to promote popular movements from place to place and intercommunication between parts, producing a perception of the whole. It allowed no parochial provincial sense to grow up which might interfere with the growth of the idea of the geographical unity of the mighty motherland. 
allowed no sense of physical comforts to to stand in the way of the sacred duty of intimately knowing one's mother country and softened the severities of severities of old world traveling by breaking the pilgrims route by a holy halting place at short intervals dharmshalas it is difficult indeed to count up the innumerable sacred spots which an overflowing religious feeling has planted throughout india now here's another section from his book called nationalism in hindu culture written in 1921 all the subordinate sects of hinduism stand on the common platform of a larger outlook an imperial conception of the geographical integrity and individuality of the mighty motherland all the creeds have a common catholicity so far as a devotion to the motherland a sense of its complete sacredness are concerned uh, the sacredness not merely of the whole but of each of all its parts thus if one is a shaiva the shastras present before him the necessity of his cultivation of the conception of the totality of the vast area throughout which are scattered the various places consecrated consecrated to the worship of the great god shiva if he wants to be a genuine devotee of his god he must visit all these various places each of which has been exalted into a holy place for its association with one out of the innumerable aspects of the deity similarly for the vaishnava are single out innumerable sacred places distributed throughout the country in all its four quarters so that he may be trained in a wider geographical consciousness and made to identify himself with the interests of a much larger country transcending the narrow limitations of his original place of birth thus whether the hindu is a shaiva or a vaishnava or a shakta in his choice of the special mode of his spiritual culture he is bound to cultivate cultivate in common with all his co-religionists the sense of an expanded geographical consciousness which alone can contribute to the expand which alone can contribute to the expansion of his mind and soul indeed it has been rightly assumed and asserted that the physical geography of india has partially influenced her history and shaped and molded the course of her culture and civilization here's another section <clears throat> now by radhakumar mukherjee again where the country is more a cultural than a material possession it appeals less to the instinct of appropriation there is more of disinterested uh, there is more of disinterested sharing more of community of life and enjoyment india thus early became the happy home of many races cults and cultures coexisting coexisting in concord with without seeking overlordship or mutual extermination with this high and complex initial responsibility india becomes the land of composite systems in respect of race language civil and personal law social structure and religious cult other national systems exclude the possibility of such radical diversities and break down in that attempt to unify them federation and imperialism have perhaps been born too late for their task such composite systems are built up necessarily on the basis of an extended unit of society here the social and political composition is based on the group and not the individual as the unit for example the family the village community the caste and various other similar corporations of which a special study is made in another work of mine meaning radha kumud mukherji entitled local government in ancient india such a principle of social construction minimizes the friction and collision of atomic units and help to and helps to harmonize the parts in and throughout and th- helps to harmonize the parts in and through the whole whole meaning the entire country biologically speaking such constructions correspond to more developed forms of organic life which in their nervous interconnections show a greater power of integration than the looser and more incoherent organisms lower down in the evolutionary series accordingly it should be further noted it is the quasi quasi instinctive postulates and conventions of the group life which come to be formulated as law and not the mandate command or decree of a single central authority in the state law under these conditions is not an artifice but a natural growth of consensus and communal life so it's not thrust on you randomly one fine morning that yeah here's the law follow it from tomorrow it's a consensus that okay you you guys do these things okay so let's just make it into law so that everyone uh, does this so that one person doesn't randomly break the harmony that everyone else has created 
that was in law in in the ancient indian sense thus ever new social and political constructions arise by the original and direct action of the groups and communities in the state and not by inter and not by the intervention of the absolute sovereign power and its creative fiats as under all centralized constitutions so he is saying that in in this case of nation states the the state the government the sovereign power makes the law and here the collective community evolves and they are allowed to evolve because it's not a hard and fast rule based religion following society so they evolve and they change their ways and that becomes a law the nationality creative and general social centralized constitutions the nationality formed on such principles is a composite nationality and not one of the rigid unitary type composite nationalism is by the way a book by maulana hussein madani uh, of the of the deobandi school of thought in islam and he got a padma bhushan and he was one of the people who opposed partition although he probably wanted uh, india to be turned into darul islam is as supposed to darul har but who knows the relation of the state to its the relation of the state to its constituent groups becomes under this scheme one of co-partnership each maintaining the others in their place it is not the state that by its sanction or charter creates its own constituent bodies or corporations but on the other hand the group the groups establish and are established by the state the genius of the hindus has adhered firmly to this fundamental principle of political organization amidst the most trying and adverse conditions in the course of their history even when the state ceased to be a national or, or organic one as under the mohammedan rule for instance they fell back upon the uh, upon the resources and possibilities of that ultimate political creed to work out the necessary adjustments and adaptations to the new situation as means of their self preservation as a people this is a very important point because this is one of the reasons that uh this is probably one of the reasons that hinduism has survived islamic invasion and and british coloniality and a uh, colonialism which no indigenous population in the world has survived so let's read this sentence again even when the state ceased to be a, a national so meaning stopped being even when the state stopped being a national or, or or organic one as under the mohammedan rule for instance they fell back upon the resources and possibilities of that ultimate political creed to work out the necessary adjustments and adaptations to the new situation as means of their self preservation as a people they clung fast to their time honored and confirmed conception of the state which was based upon a respect for the original and primary rights of group life for the sanctity of natural groupings the inviolability of the vital nodes and modes of human association to which a full scope was accordingly never denied and thus the hindu state came naturally to be associated and indeed very largely identified with a multitude of institutions and corporations of diverse types structures and functions in and through which the many-sided genius of the race expressed itself it was these intermediate bodies it was these intermediate bodies between the individual and the state which mattered most to the lives of the people to the conservation of their culture as the real seats and centers of national activity accordingly when a state of this complex composition and structure happens to pass under foreign control the nation can maintain the freedom of its life and culture by means of that larger and more vital part of the state which is not amenable to foreign control and is by design independent of the central authority so it's unaffected by british colonialism and 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 islamic invasions an elaborately devised machinery of social and economic self government amply safeguards the interests of national life and culture what is lost but an in, what is lost but an inferior and and insignificant limb of the body politic its more vital organs are quite intact it is as if the mere outwork has fallen the main stronghold of national life it is it is as if the mere outwork has fallen the main stronghold of national life stands firm and entire against the onslaughts of alien aggression protected by a deep and wide gulf of separation and aloofness from the domain of central authority which can find no points of substantial contact which can find no points of substantial contact with the life of the people and no means of controlling the institutions no means of controlling the institutions expressing and molding that life it is thus that hindu culture has had a continuous history 
uninterrupted by the foreign domination to which a national culture would otherwise succumb as this has happened everywhere everywhere else on earth a complete exposition of this composite type of nationality and polity such as stands to the credit of india as her special achievement must wait for another opportunity and occasion but in passing we may as well broadly indicate the lines of its actual operation and also of its possibilities as an instrument for the unification of the human race or the federation of man the principles of the indian political constructions tend naturally as a closer analysis to, will show to reconcile the conflicting claims and ideals of nationalism and internationalism in a stable synthesis towards which the league of nations is hopelessly striving <laughs> the relations obtaining within the state between the central authority and the constituent groups on which depends so largely its external uh, on which depends so largely its internal order and peace form the plan and pattern of its external relations also comparative politics indeed point to a kind of correspondence between the principles governing the internal principle between the principles governing the internal inst- uh, uh, constitution of states and the principles governing their external expansion the intra state and the inter state relations are fundamentally of the same type the state that is of a central type and thus absorbs the original and originating groups in its own unitary life will also exhibit the same militarist spirit of domination and aggression in its movement of expansion by absorbing other states Similarly the expansion or extension of the indian state will not be a process of absorption by assimilation or or extermination of external states neighborly or rival but will be governed by those principles already referred to which regulate the internal constitution of the state itself in relation to its constituent groups those are the principles of a generous comprehension that broaden the basis of an interstate convention under which all all subject peoples are established in their own conventions and all subject states in their own constitution or customary law the problems before the league of nations of reconciling the uh, self determination self determination the problems before the league of nations of reconciling the self determination of individual sovereign states with the interests of the collective brotherhood of all the states will defy solution under the under the militarist and unitary principles of political formation such as we meet it meet with in the west but they are amenable to the other method of comprehension which has been explained as the basic principle of the indian type of state in both its internal and external relations it is hoped that the that the indian experiment in nationality which seeks and is called upon to unify different ethnic stocks and cultures different systems of law and cult different groups and corporations in an all embracing and all comprehensive polity will be found to be a much needed guide in our progress towards that quote unquote far off divine event to which the whole creation moves peace on earth and goodwill among men and now we learn of acharya jodunath sarkar's views on whether and on how india is a civilizational state Jadunna Sarkar writes in his book India Through the Ages 1928 The Indian people form one common and distinct type No careful student of our history can help being st- uh, struck by one supreme vital characteristic of the Indian people It is their vitality as a distinct type with a distinct civilization of their own and a mind as active after centuries of foreign rule as ever in the past The Indian people of today are no doubt a composite ethnic product uh, but whatever their different constituent elements may have been in origin they have all acquired a common Indian stamp and have all been contributing to a common culture and building up a common type of traditions thought and literature even sir herbert risley who is so skeptical about indians claim to be considered as one people has been forced to admit that quote unquote beneath the manifold diversity of physical and social type language custom and religion which strikes the observer in india there can still be discerned a certain quote unquote underlying uniformity of life from the himalayas to cape comorin which is kanyakumari there is in fact an indian character a general indian personality which we cannot resolve into its component elements so you understand that the argument that there was no india as as such before 1947 is pure rubbish this common indian type has stood the st- stood the test of time 
It has outlived the shock of dynastic revolutions, foreign invasions, religious conflicts, and widespread natural disasters. Its best right to live is the vital power displayed by it through many thousands of years of cataclysmic change in our land. He also writes, from early times, from early Hindu times, this this internal isolation was often broken, and a pan-Indian community of ideas, customs, and culture was created by certain agencies. These were the pilgrim student, the soldier of fortune, the imperial conqueror, the son-in-law imported from the centers of blood, such as centers of blue blood, such as Kanauj or Prayag for Brahmins, and Mewar and Marwar in the case of Kshatriyas. For the purpose of hypergamy or raising the social status of a rich man settled among lower castes in a far off provinces in a far off province the great holy cities of of the different provinces were regarded as sources of sanctity by all indians alike they were besides uh, besides seats of the highest sanskrit learning or universities of the type of medieval university of paris such were banaras and nalanda mathura and takshila ujjaini and prayag kanchi and madura also known as Madurai, and to a lesser extent, Navadvip, Navadvip in Bengal. The sacred streams and temples of the north were looked upon with veneration and lifelong yearning to visit them. By the men of the south, and in the same way, Puri and Kanchi, Shetubandhu and Sringeri, Dwarka and Nashik were eagerly visited by devoted pilgrims from north of India in spite of the immense distances to be crossed. Furthermore, for the benefit of those who could not travel, some local rivers and cities of the south were named after those of the north and regarded as equally sanctifying. Thus, Madura is the southern Mathura. Oh my God! Thus, Madura is the southern Mathura, and Godavari is the southern Ganges, Ganga Godavari. Great Sanskrit scholars and saints like Sh- uh, Shankaracharya and Chaitanya have passed from one end of Hindu India to another, everywhere conquering their rivals in disputations as Samudra Gupta and other kings bent on Digvijaya did in arms. This presupposed cultural uniformity. This is the most important sentence. 